All right, welcome back to another epidose of the Ketogenic Fasting Project on Carnivore. My name is Tom, and today's guest is Sean Baker, Dr. Sean Baker, well known in the uh, carnivore community. So I had him on today to talk about uh, things like um, lifestyle changes, changing your diet, and the type of effects he's, he's seen it have on people. So how are you doing this morning? I'm doing well. Uh, great. It's, uh, you know, a little bit of a cool morning. I've been up walking the dogs, feeding the animals. I've got some uh, food for me cooking in the grill. So I'll be doing good here. Real good here in a little bit. So, so do you ever have a problem figuring out what you're going to cook on? I mean, you got every, every modern convenience known to man now, right? Um, you know, I find that it depends on the steak I'm cooking, you know, or the type of food I'm cooking, you know, so I mean, some, you know, and the weather, you know, I like being outdoors grilling. That's my favorite thing to do. So, uh, you know, it kind of depends on what's going on, what it was, and how much time I have, but sure. how much forethought I give into things. Sometimes I, you know, I think about it and I'll, I'll do it a certain way. Um, you know, last time, I, last time I had this big old three pound tomahawk ribeye and, uh, you know, I wanted to really make sure I, I treated it well. So I actually put it in this little sous vide grill type device I have for, for a couple hours. It got it to like a 125 degrees on the inside and then I went and grilled it super hot in this 1500 degree grill I have to kind of sear it real nice, a little salt on it. So that, uh, Very cool. That worked well. Yeah, I know a lot of my cooking revolves around how much time, free time I have, so. Definitely, a, definitely affects, affects the choices and preparation. You know, I, I should probably talk about the background picture here. So behind me is a picture of Sean setting another record at the indoor rowing championship in Long Beach, California. That was earlier this year, right? Was that like January? Uh, actually, yeah, it was February. Yeah, I didn't February. set a record. I won the world championship, but, but I hadn't, you know, that wasn't a record performance. In fact, I kind of slipped off the seat on the first pull that thing and it kind of kind of messed me up a little bit so I didn't get the time I wanted but uh you know nonetheless I think I won the guy next to me had second and I think I beat him by about five or six seconds mm. over the 500 meters which is only about a you know minute and 20 second event I think I was 117 something or another when I did that I'm debating whether to go do it next year in but it's in Paris so I may be going to Paris to do to do it again and hopefully hopefully retain my championship title I think I have a little video clip queued up from that that we can play later. So okay. it's not the best quality, but That's all right. I was shooting it with a long lens and first time I'd use that camera. So it's a little jittery, but. <laughs> well, thanks for that. Yeah, it's a good picture. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on helping people with lifestyle changes and maybe uh, integrating that into the rest of their family life. Well, I mean, my, you know, sort of personal belief as it has evolved over time, I think it is probably the most important thing we can do with regard to health and well-being. I mean, I think, you know, even as a practicing physician, the amount of impact I was able to have on people's lives pales in comparison with what I've been able to accomplish via lifestyle, you know, approach. And, and most of that is obviously nutrition. And I think there's a training component, sleep, rest, recovery, you know, all, you know, stress reduction, uh, those things can play a role, but, but obviously, as you know, I'm a proponent of a somewhat of an unusual diet, and, but that has been profoundly effective in, in literally thousands of people's lives. I think it's very fascinating. And so I'm not sure what you mean by the family. Are you talking about my family or are you talking about families in general though? You know, I get a lot of questions because uh, I have that uh, Facebook group, Autistic Carnivores, and obviously what happens a lot of the times we get parents, grandparents, clinicians, uh, dietitians, a uh, few physicians and stuff like that who have tried carnivore and then uh, they're interested in helping their kids, particularly kids with autism and other family members, you know, it's, it's kind of, they're always looking for tips on, uh, everything from prepping meals to getting people interested to building some curiosity, you know, pointing them towards other people who've had results, you know, all that stuff. So, well, I mean, certainly, you know, your family is going to be very much aware of your, you know, failures and successes. And so, you know, I mean, you're kind of a walking billboard for whatever you're doing. I mean, it's, it's something they see and they can see, 
how compliant you may be and you know what what the effects are and so you can't really can't really hide from family and you know my family in particular uh you know they particularly my my girlfriend has adopted a almost completely carnivorous diet based on you know the, the success i've had and she came from basically a vegetarian background and uh uh, my children, you know, as you know, Tom, I've have an, I have an autistic child, although I only have him part time, which is kind of a bit of a challenge for trying to dictate dietary policy. And not that uh, kids shouldn't have a say in what they eat, but I mean, you know, if you give kids, if you let kids free reign to choose what they want, they'll be eating, you know, uh, candy and cake and you know, junk food, pizza all the time. I mean, that's, sure. that's just what they gravitate to, and uh, so. Um, I think it's one of the things I really like about the fact that you started this group and, and I certainly from time to time will peek in there and see what's going on because obviously I have a vested interest in, you know, helping people with autism, particularly as I have an autistic son, um, is that, uh, you know, you, when you get the adult, adults that can actually, uh, sorry, my dog is scratching here. Max, I got a dog. Adults. I got a dog uh, sitting behind me too. So yeah, he's sitting at any floor, moment. My floor is a, it's, it's a, it's a wood floor. So when he scratches it, it makes sense. But what I was saying is, you know, with the adults, you can kind of get a better uh, understanding of how diet impacts them. They're better ex expressing what's going on, you know, you know particularly the autistic and, and uh, you know, Asperger's and, and the other sort of things that are that fall in that same category. Whereas younger children in particular have a harder time, you know, expressing those thoughts. And so, my, my boy is 13, and so he is, you know, at a point where he understands a lot more than he did, you know, four or five years ago. But still, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of a challenge to, to figure out what's going on. But yeah, I think, uh, you know, certainly uh, family's going to be impacted one way or another by what you do. They either like it or they don't, or they are inspired or they're, you know, they're, they're appalled. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just a matter of, you know, it's a fact of life. And uh, I think more often than not, what I'm seeing, you know, particularly with regard to this carnivore diet is so many family members are seeing the success that many of them are adopting it themselves, which I think is pretty cool. And uh, we're seeing, you know, whole families, uh, lives and health transform. Yeah, I think uh, part of the, the uh, solution is just having some patience because when they do see results or they, their curiosity builds and they're more likely to to give it a try and maybe it's just it's a matter of not uh pushing the issue too early you know just kind of let it build i don't know if you saw that video i did with the nusky family they had a little guy who had tourette's and uh you know he was very ocd and add and uh they they switched the family started switching the family over to a keto meat-based keto diet very little plant material and not only did their son kind of turn around but the husband lost 100 pounds you know and the wife uh, resolved some issues so was no, like, I, you know, like I, well. I wasn't aware of that but that sounds wonderful it's awesome to see i mean I've, you know, like i said i've seen so many success stories and i can't can't even keep up with them but uh, that's 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 great to, to see and share and I, you know and, and that's another thing i i, I suspect Tourette's would be significantly influenced by uh, diet, you know, I guess just with the uh, sort of, uh, you know, I think, again, I think some of these unstable glucose levels trigger different behaviors that we see. Yeah, it seems like when you eat too many carbohydrates, your, your body really can't regulate uh, glucose metabol metabolism in the brain very well. And of course, there's this issue that's sort of being studied of um, insulin resistance in the brain, it seems to have some sort of effect on all these things. I know you, you guys just did that podcast with, uh, Chris Palmer MD and he was talking about that, right? Yeah. We've had Chris on and I think Amy uh, Berger, you know, she talks about insulin resistance and, and the development of, uh, dementia like Alzheimer's disease. So yeah, clearly I think that, uh, there is a significant impact that, uh, unstable glucose has on brain physiology. I think that's pretty clear. Yeah, it seems to have an impact on, you know, anxiety and depression and perhaps Tourette's and maybe even um, schizophrenia and stuff like that. It seems like all those subjects are sort of influenced by it. So what do you do you have any particular strategies you recommend for people to find like a 
a proper like protein to fat ratio for them as an individual? I mean, you know, again, this is a very much a controversial topic within the carnivore community, as you probably are well aware. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, me personally, I think that, uh, and I think there's some pretty good literature that supports it. I think lean muscle mass is important. I think it's important to preserve it, build it, maintain it. I think it has not only disease protection benefits, but it has longevity benefits. I mean, there's pretty good data that supports that. And so I, you know, I tend to skew towards making sure people get enough protein. You know, I mean, I think we just look at absolute amounts first and making sure you're getting enough. And I think that's, you know, for me, it's, 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 it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.8 to, or sorry, uh, 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram, um, you know, just for, for the average person. And, and I think there's some evidence that as we get older, that, that amount you certainly want to skew to the higher side rather than the lower side. And then particularly if you're athletic and trying to engage in active muscle building, then, then those numbers might even go up from there. So assuming you're hitting that number, then I think the uh, uh, fat ratio is going to be dependent upon what you're doing and how much energy you expend and how much energy you utilize. And I think there's pretty good feedback to, that our body will let us know that if we're not taking in enough you know, calories or fat, then we are fatigued, we have poor energy, poor performance. And that's assuming you've made it through the transition part, because I think there's other issues that are, that are occurring, you know, in the, in the one to two month transition period. And so I think once you get into this steady state, then, then you have to kind of listen to your body intuitively. And I know uh, for me, um, I don't quite go as much pro or as much fat as People like the the paleo, you know, the PKD folks do with the two to one ratio, which is about eighty one percent of your calories come from, coming from fat. Uh, just because I, I just don't want to eat that much. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just it would be it would be a lot of calories for me, more than I actually need, uh, based on how much activity I have, my size, and the protein that I take in. And then I think, uh, but I but I certainly skew towards higher fat. I mean, I'm certainly. Uh, above 50% of my calories, more often 60, 70%. And I think that feels pretty good for me. I mean, that's when I feel and perform my best. Um, when I'm really sort of concerned more about vanity type stuff and I want to get leaner, then I find that, that going a little bit leaner just, just helps me in that regard. Now, there are people that will say that satiety, um, they feel better satiated with higher fat and, and they may in turn eat less and that for and that for. And therefore, that leads to weight loss for them, and I think that certainly occurs. I'm at a point where I'm already pretty lean, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm at a healthy, you know, healthy body composition, and it's just a matter of, you know, do I want to get really lean? And then that that's where the, the, the leaner sort of strategy comes in, comes into play. Yeah, I think when it comes to fat ratio, it gets confusing for a number of reasons. First of all, when you when you read the recommendations on how much protein to consume, there's mixed units, right? And so you got imperial units and you got metric units. And then you got some people are talking about lean body mass. Some people are talking about total body mass, you know, and it's, it, it gets confusing for people, you know, trying to figure that out. And then when it comes to ratios, you got, if you want to control seizures, you might be all the way up there to four to one, four, four parts fat, to one part protein. But like you said, if you want to get lean, you might be eating more protein and less fat. So I think I like to encourage people just to experiment and try and figure out, first of all, what their goal is. Obviously, you know, I did the PKD diet to get rid of um, psori my psoriasis, finally get rid of my psoriasis to figure it out. And that was, I think I was eating roughly two to one, maybe three to one. And uh, it worked. But then when I started weightlifting again, I clearly needed a lot more protein, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I think, you know, like I said, if you're dealing with some sort of life altering disease, then, then if that strategy works for you, by, by all means pursue that. But, you know, once you've, once you've maybe got there, then, then you talk about long-term function and health, and then there may be more benefit to protein. I, I, you know, there's a lot of sort of demonization or about of, of protein in, in the sort of longevity community uh, with regard to, you know, mTOR stimulation, and I think that is highly nuanced, highly context dependent. We see that uh, we want to stimulate mTOR in the context of, of muscle building. I think that's important regardless of our age. Uh, and that 
you know, and that occurs, uh, you know, in conjunction with, with doing the things that build muscle, which would be resistance training. So if you're going to just eat a bunch of protein and then not do anything with it, that may be a problem. But if you're out there exercising, uh, then protein becomes, you know, I think, a, a more important uh, macronutrient. Yeah, you know what? You know when the light really went on for me for with the increasing protein levels when I started back in the gym weightlifting and I was listening to probably the your HBO podcast with Dr. Lyon and she was talking about calculating leucine levels. So actually looking at somebody's blood volume and trying to figure out how much how much steak they have to eat in order to get their leucine levels up to an optimal level to to encourage muscle growth. And it, that was kind of like one of the first times when I was like, well, I can actually pencil that out and put myself in a place where muscle building would be easy just based on, you know, something that I can actually measure, right? And that really kind of sort of cemented in that there was, there was, there was a strategy here to be developed on an individual level. Yeah, I mean, you know, if we listen to guys like Don Lehman or uh, Stu Phillips, I think Keith Barr as well, I mean, they seem to think that, you know, just on a meal per meal basis, something like 2.5 to 3 grams of leucine, you know, in that meal is going to get you to that point where you turn on mTOR and subsequently muscle protein synthesis. Now, again, obviously blood volume will vary from person to person, but it doesn't vary as much as you think. You know, a big person doesn't person who weighs twice as much as somebody else doesn't have twice as much blood. I mean, there's not, it doesn't scale quite that way. Now there may be a, you know, a, a general increase, but it's not, you know, that the 200 pound guy needs to eat twice as much as the 100 pound gal. It's, it's not, you know, it doesn't scale one for one. And so, uh, so you, while the big guy probably does need to eat a little bit more than the, than the girl uh, for, with, with respect to leucine, you know, the, the, the smaller people still need to get adequate amounts of leucine. So what type of stuff do you do with your uh, carnivore training program? So, yeah, the carnivore training system, you know, that I developed uh, is basically, you know, mostly an exercise based system. You know, it's, it's, you know, when, when I, when I think about the things and, and there's certainly diet, you know, how to, how to incorporate diet in there as well. And, you know, as you know, carnivore diet is not that difficult. I mean, it's the easiest diet out there. So, and, yeah. I, but it's, it's, it's a lot of exercise, but, but it shows you how to incorporate the diet into that. Um, and we're getting ready to refilm it. I know we're going to kind of upgrade it, but I mean, the basic package was uh, um, 12 weeks of, you know, things that I, that I have found to be important with regard to general health uh, and fitness. And they include, you know, strength training, um, via things like compound, basic compound movements, uh, hypertrophy work, which would be more your, cl your classical bodybuilding type stuff. So you want to put on, build the muscle mass as well as be strong. There is a conditioning element. Uh, and I think that's a lot of you know, high intensity interval type training. I, I, I tend to just to stay away from uh, kind of long chronic, chronic steady state cardio, just from a time management standpoint, I think you can get the same benefits from a cardiorespiratory standpoint, doing the, the, the you know, high intensity interval type training. And then the other thing, the other component, which I think many people totally ignore as they get older uh, or in general, is just that explosive uh, power development, the ability to jump, the ability to throw, the ability to sprint. And so those things are incorporated in there in kind of a, in a logical fashion, which involves what I think are very efficient exercises, but also very effective and also very importantly, very, I think, relatively safe things. I mean, there's, you know, it doesn't do you any good to get hurt because then you're right. on lines. And so the exercises and, and, and the way I put them together, you know, has all those things in mind. Yeah. I kind of, you know, I think everybody kind of gets that uh, impression that you're supposed to be doing cardio and weights all the time and you got to do as much cardio as possible. But I, uh, I had to stop doing any running or sprinting or anything because I got a developed a heel spur. It was pretty, it was pretty debilitating, and I've just been lifting, and I'm still getting the same results, if not better. You know, and I basically, I might do some elliptical work, and that's about it. It's about all my foot can take. So I was kind of surprised that just spent maybe spending a little more time lifting, but not a lot. I was I still am getting leaner and leaner and leaner. So, 
Yeah, you can definitely get a cardiovascular benefit from lifting. I mean, there's pretty good evidence to show that your heart rate can go way, way up there, you know, lifting, depending on what you're doing. You know, if you do yeah. a, you know, a set of 20 rep squats with a relatively decent amount of weight, your, your heart rate's going to be, you know, close to, close to its max a lot of times when you do that. So yeah, you can definitely. Yeah, doing 100 reps of any, any, just about any weight of a squat is, <laughs> is a lot of work. Well, 100 reps is, yeah, I mean, I'm just even 20 reps is, is a lot of work, yeah. particularly if it's heavy enough. But yeah, 100 reps is, is, is also very challenging. I, I rarely, I can only think about one time I did 100 reps of, of any weight on my back, you know, other than body weight reps. You know, but, uh, I did, a, I, did a, I did a 135 pound, 100, 100 rep set one time and couldn't walk for about three days afterwards. That so was, that was about 20 years ago though. So I haven't reproduced that yet. So what's the news on your your book finally coming out, man? That thing's been sitting in my Amazon pre-order shopping cart for like a year. Yeah, so it's out November nineteenth. It's it's at the it's actually being printed right now. It's at the publisher. Everything's finalized. Yeah, we went back and forth. You know, I, I had it ready last September basically, and then the publisher said uh, came back with me and said we want more autobiographical stuff. And then we went back mm -hmm. and forth several times, and uh, I just. Uh, you know, I guess it's, you know, when you have a, when you have a publisher involved and an editor, they, they kind of, you know, want to, want to put their two cents in there. And I mean, it's fine. And it's been, I think a good decision, but uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, going to be out. Hopefully uh, it'll do well. I think the pre-sales so far seem to be fairly strong and uh, you know, I think it's going to potentially be, you know, something that, that will drive the, you know, the conversation on a, any more, you know, larger audience i think we're gonna we're gonna reach a lot more people and get this discussion going i think we're already seeing it you know we're seeing this the political climate you know with the elections coming up the presidential elections and the debates around climate change and what role you know eating meat has in there has people very polarized on that topic and i think yeah. we really do need to have that discussion and really look at all the all the information out there and really look at the actual impact we could make you know, depending on what decisions we, we decide to go with. Yeah, for sure. You know, I often think about this. I think, think about the whole carnivore movement kind of exploded at, at one point, what a couple, maybe a year and a half, two years ago. It seems like there were so many people trying a ketogenic diet at that point. And I think a lot of people just naturally were gravita gravitating towards eating meat. And in the back of their mind, there was this resistance because they were like, well, if I eat too much meat, then there's going to be all this uh, gluconeogenesis going on and my blood sugar is going to spike. But at the same time, I think their biology was just kind of tugging on them. And that, that's where I was when I, I was just exploring like the Facebook groups and the, the other websites going, wow, there's all these people out here that just eat meat, you know? Maybe this is a doable thing. And then you popped up on uh, Joe Rogan's podcast. And then I think I joined World Carnivore Tribe and it was like 5,000 people or something. And I couldn't believe how big that group was. And now it's like 35,000 people or something. And it's a lot of times I think about that timing of that all sort of snowballing. And I think, well, what it must be like for you to have sort of popped up and had that whole thing sort of snowball and explode everywhere like that. What was that like? Well, you know, I've been fairly active and in, 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 in sort of trying to drive that, that, that growth. Obviously I'm, you know, I'm out there on social media pretty much every yeah. day trying to get the message out there because I believe in it. And I believe it's, you know, not that I'm saying every human on the planet needs to do this, but I, you know, as you know, there are, there are literally millions upon days, people that are struggling, that are suffering, uh, and this is a very effective and very easy solution that seems to work for the vast majority of people to try it. And so I think it's important to get that message out there because we could, you know, we could literally change the landscape of our population health. And we've got so many looming, not only, not only looming, but they're already here. These disasters that are occurring, these tremendous financial burdens that we're putting on not only individuals and families, but the entire economy is, you know, our healthcare, uh, you know, budget is, is just ridiculous for, for how sick we are. I mean, we should be, if we're spending that money, we should not have a sick population and the opposite is occurring. We're spending more money. We're having more sick people and it just, it just kind of snowballs. And so, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I literally every single day I have, you know, not, not, you know, several people, but dozens of people contacting me with uh, thoughts, ideas, uh, or, or, or success stories. I mean, that, that is, you know, I get so many people uh, out there saying, you know, thanks for what you're doing and uh, you've impacted my life in a very good way. And it's, it's something that's very mo motivating for me. Um, but at the same time, there's, there's a lot of people that feel that I do and there's a lot of passion out there and everybody wants to, you know, just do the right thing. And I think that, uh, as this sort of movement continues to grow and become viable and successful, I would see there is some negative pushback that you'll get from people that are threatened by that. And, and this is, you know, people that profit on sickness and we certainly see that, uh, you know, not the, the entire pharmaceutical industry is completely evil or awful, but they certainly profit from illness and, you know, and, and uh, the incentive to treat symptoms rather than cure diseases is, you know, the, the, the financial side, the balance sheet doesn't work in favor of cure, curing illness. I mean, it really doesn't. Right. And, uh, that's the model that, that, that that's sort of made people billions upon billions of dollars. So it's a, uh, it's definitely a challenge from day to day. There's a lot of naysayers. I get a lot of, uh, negatively thrown my way and you know as, as I'm kind of a person that doesn't that likes to compete I give it back a lot sometimes and sometimes in a uh, uh, what would I say controversial way sometimes I piss people off but at the same time I think it's it's important to you know do things that get get an audience because again you can have the best message in the world but if no one is listening to you. No one's here. No one hears a message. Then, you know, it's a waste of time. So. Right, right. Yeah, no. It's important to go out and try and find the people that are looking for the message, and not necessarily focus on changing anybody's mind. But there are so many people suffering out there. I think a lot of people are looking for something else to try. You know, and I think that's the people we're looking for. And I know that there's some of that's going on. Well, I get people refer to autistic carnivores by you pretty regularly it seems like a get a few a week trickling in in fact i think yesterday was the one year anniversary of that group and we're up to 580 some odd people it just continually grows and people are really happy to find the group because it just there's just enough people out there that 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 are looking for it you know and i think that's the thing is find the people that are looking for the message and deliver it to them you know yeah, I think that's a great thing, you know, to, to, to do that because, you know, we've got so many people from that have had so many different various illnesses, whether it's, um, you know, autoimmune diseases like psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, uh, uh, you know Crohn's disease, also colitis, people with mental health disorders, depression, anxiety, you know, things like autism, that, that they have these the splinter groups that you know, like if you were to go on to an autism only board, and I hear this repeatedly, like people go on a Crohn's board and they suggest a carnivore diet, they often get kicked off the community. They get kicked out of the community because it's, you know, it's yeah. seen as heresy. And so having these mm -hmm. resources, these individual communities that are carnivore focused, I think is, is a great thing. And it's going to help those people to do that. And uh, hopefully the, the proof will be, you know, in the pudding, so to speak, or the proof will be in the ribeye, I guess, that Mm -hmm. You know, you see what the results are relative to standard of care or relative to other lifestyle um, uh, strategies. And, you know, like I said, obviously I'm very biased and I'm very much uh, a cheerleader for carnivore. But I think at the end of the day, we want to see what works best for all people, for the most people and what diseases or, or conditions respond to whatever dietary protocol, whether it's plant-based, animal-based, Mediterranean-based, ketogenic. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. And so while I, I dedicate my time and, 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 and my concern is on the carnivore side of things and the meat-based side of things, I don't dismiss that those things can be, uh, can be treated other ways, but it's not my job to, to, to tell people to eat a balanced diet or control your calories. Uh, yeah. you know, and, and again, those things may work for many people, but at the same time, you know, there, there, there's plenty of people you can go to see that do that. So if you're, if you, if you believe in a balanced diet, there's literally millions of people that you can go to or thousands of dietitians that you can go to. Uh, and if it doesn't work for you and you want to try something else, then here's, here's me and, and the carnivore community that you can, you can try that as well. 
Yeah, you know, that that comes up just when I'm talking to people and I guys talk about the fact that I just eat meat and they're like, well, it's supposed to be a balanced diet. I say, well, what does that mean? You know, and you ask the average person what that actually means and they're stumped. They're like a balance of what, you know, and, and they can't answer the question, so. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the whole balanced diet concept. You know, you're like, what other animal on the planet eats a balanced diet? You know, pretty much none. And what would be, what would the balanced diet look like for humans, you know, 50,000 years ago when they didn't have grocery stores? I mean, what could they have possibly eaten? I doubt you could have eaten, you know, seven different colors a day and your you know, 11 servings of fruits and vegetables a day. I mean, that, that just wasn't doable. I mean, just, just if you apply any sort of critical basic thinking on, you know, what, what the evolutionary diet of a human being was. And, you know, we have this, uh, uh, you know, I think we, you know, I think our food, I think our modern diet is so devoid of nutrition that we're just scrambling to put enough things together. It's just like, well, eat a little bit of everything and maybe you'll get, maybe you'll get, you know, some nutrition uh, out of that. And, yeah. uh, you know, and there's vested interests, you know, I mean, balanced diet. I mean, you know, eat a little bit of stuff from the cereal industry, eat a little bit of stuff from the soda pop industry, eat a little stuff from the fruit and vegetable industry, eat a little stuff from the dairy industry. I mean, it's, it's all everybody wanting to get their piece of the piece of the, you know, in there. And I, yeah, really, I mean, a balanced diet is really hard to define. It is, it is, you know, the eye of the beholder. It's where you live. It's what's available to you. And, you know, I, I just don't see a balanced diet as, as, as something that was possible for the vast majority of humanity through much of its, you know, its time on earth. Yeah, I mentioned to people, it's like, you know, I'd go in the produce section at your supermarket and you go there and find a fruit or vegetable that was available 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago. You can't go back very far before none of that stuff really existed. You know, that all was sort of cultivated from something else. You know, maybe there were some berries or something like that. And, but most of those things didn't exist in that form. They didn't taste good. They were full of seeds and, you know, they weren't sweet and they weren't all that colorful and you had to compete with them with, you know, with, for, to eat those with other animals and bugs and stuff that we've all sort of gotten rid of that competition as well. So it's a, none of that food really existed, not in the form we're used to anyways. So I think people, people, a lot of people kind of know that because, you know, you talk to one person, they know, oh yeah, I saw this documentary about potatoes and somebody else saw a documentary about cabbage or whatever. And they realize that stuff just wasn't available individually. And they never look at it as a whole, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's, it's, uh, you know, people don't know. I mean, broccoli didn't make its appearance in the United States till the 1920s. I mean, and, you know, it was in, in England in the 1800s and, you know, maybe arguably in Italy and perhaps in China, but I mean, that was at most, it was a couple thousand years old, maybe 2000 years old. And you got to remember we, you know, yeah, we, we as homo sapiens have been around, you know, arguably 300,000 years now and humans up to 3 million years. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, and, and, the, and your point about, you know, we lived in a time again of mostly it was cold. It was, it was ice age through much of the last 3 million years. We're in, we're in an unusually warm, warm period right now, relative right. to all of our species have been on the planet. And so the food selection looked very different. We didn't, we weren't living in Costa Rica. We were living in kind of Canada for most of that. Uh, if, you, if you want to look at the climate differences and so what was available and you're very much correct. I mean, you had to compete with, uh, you know, the birds that would eat all the berries and the other animals that would eat the berries and humans often didn't have first choice of those things. And they, they were only limited in the time they were available. And, you know, nowadays what we have is we, have these massive monocrops and we, you know, we kill all the predator or we kill all the other animals that would otherwise eat the food and we protect it. And it is, again, it is very much our capacity to eat that stuff today is, is, you know, orders of magnitude greater than what it would have been, you know, even, even a couple hundred years ago, really. Yeah. I guess even the banana didn't really debut until the world's fair the same year that the telephone was shown off you know so it's a relatively recent you know it kind of puts it in terms of the modern age you know brought us fruit like that that had to be modified in order to really be worth eating you know so we didn't grow up eating bananas 
Well, I've got a little video. Did you want to say something else about that? No, no, go ahead, Tom. That's fine. I think I got a little it. clip here. I'm going to try and share of you at that rowing competition. Let's see if we can get this working. So I shot this, so I might as well, uh, might yeah, as well okay. try and use it. Sure, sure. Oh, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's just me trying to go as hard as I can. You know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, it's 500 meters. It only lasts about a minute. You know, this, I think this was a minute 17 for me, but it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, it looks like I kind of fast forwarded through, but it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty, it's pretty, it's a pretty painful, you know, painful thing when you're doing it. Yeah, that was the first time I'd ever, you know, been to an event like that. And I was pretty amazed. There were some pretty amazing athletes in that room. I remember one guy with one leg, you know, had a prosthetic leg. And he was probably, you know, I was roughly retirement age. And he had the biggest upper body I think I'd ever seen. He was just gigantic on top. I mean, just huge. And he was rowing. You know, like I said, and, you know, he had a prosthetic leg on top of that. And, of course, a lot of people there were tall. I got there and I – I felt short. I mean, I'm about five eleven, and I, I was walking around. It's like, God, everybody in here is a freaking giant. <laughs> yeah, no, rowing definitely it favors taller athletes, and so a lot yeah. of the guys, and we, you know, a lot of the people in that room were Olympians, uh, active Olympians, and so I think the guy that won the overall was, you know, this guy Anton Bondarenko, who's a six foot ten Ukrainian guy, and so um, I think he got he got me by about two seconds on that, and so. I'm kind of annoyed that I, I probably had I known what his time was going to be, I think I probably could have gotten him. But uh, you know, had I not slipped off the seat and prepared for knowing what what time I needed. So, but yeah, they're tall people. You know, I, like I said, I, I took a picture of myself with the with the gal, the female, and I think mm. she's uh, where is she from? She's also uh, maybe uh, Belarus or, or Ukrainian as well. Uh, and she literally is, and I'm, you know, I'm 6'5", 240, 250, depending on what my last meal was, but um, she was literally my size. I mean, she was actually might even been a little taller than me. I think she yeah. probably had a half inch on me and was probably close to my weight, if not my weight. <laughs> you know? Yeah. She probably, she probably was about 225, I'd say. But she's, she's just a ginormous person. Mm -hmm. And her husband, uh, 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 it's, uh, Pavel Shermay. Uh, he is uh, another Belarusian guy that was, and he beat me by a tenth of a second. He was a he was a, ch a champion Olympian that uh, was one of the fastest guys ever on this thing. He was, huh. like, he was like one of only five men in the world that have rode a sub five forty two k. So he's like, there's more, there's less guys that have done that than it's than it's than have stood on the moon. So it's a pretty amazing achievement, and, and to be within a tenth of a second of that guy, I was pretty pretty pleased to do. How many times a week do you get on your concept to? Um, you know, several times at least. Depends. You know, like right now I'm kind of focusing. In fact, the last couple of weeks I've done pretty much nothing else but row. And it's it's very, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm just kind of – I kind of go for a period of times where I'll just do a month where all I'm going to do is row. But I always try to get back to uh, lifting and stuff. But right now, I mean, I'm doing – once a day rowing and it's for, a lot of times it's very short i may just go in there and do a 500 meter row that may be my whole workout for the day in fact my whole workout yesterday took three minutes and 7.5 seconds i mean that was it yeah i think uh, that i you mentioned that before on one of your videos it's like you know sometimes maintaining or even maintaining plus achieving some it doesn't really require a huge time commitment every day yeah, I mean that's that's the thing. A lot of people think I spend two or three hours a day working out, and that that's you know extremely far from the truth. Now, in, in years past, I had certainly done high volume, a lot of work, a lot of time in the gym, and and that sort of stuff. But I, I find this, you know, particularly you know maybe maybe the diet also allows for this. And I can maintain or or even make progress with less effort. You know, I think I think nutrition plays a role in that, but. Uh, when, when I do exercise, I mean, I, I definitely do it in a very intense way. I mean, it's very much, I'm not dilly-dallying. I'm, I'm really pushing my body pretty, pretty hard. And, uh, uh, but I don't, I, but I find that I don't have to spend a lot of time with a lot of volume, depending on my goals. You know, I think about building muscle and trying to bodybuild, and I think a little more volume, a little more time is going to be required. But for what I'm doing right now, 
um, I really don't need to spend a lot of time doing it. All right. Well, I think we covered just about anything. Uh, is there anything else? Uh, well, I, I will mention for people who don't know, Sean does almost a daily short video that's his, on his own channel on YouTube, right? It's usually like five or 10 minutes. And then you have the long format podcast with, with Zach Bitter, which is the human performance outlier, which is on YouTube and just about every platform out there for audio, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I've recently just kind of gotten, you know, I didn't really do much with my YouTube channel. I kind of was kind of putting videos out here once in a while. So I recently just decided to, to, to sort of, uh, you know, first thing in the morning after when I, as, as I wake up as part of my morning routine, I'll just throw up a you know, five to 15 minute topic on whatever I want to talk about and uh, put that up there. And then, uh, uh, so like I said, one of the goals is to try to reach more people in any format available. And YouTube is one that I hadn't really used as much as in the past. So I'm trying to make a dedicated effort to do a little bit more of that. So we're seeing, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people like that format. And I, and I quite honestly, I like it as well. I like to talk rather than type, you know, I, I, I just, even though I've written a book, you know, writing stuff is not my, 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 my favorite way to communicate, although it's very, it can be very effective and you can get time to, Sure. When you're speaking, you often misspeak and you, you often say, oh, I wish I wouldn't have said it that way. And you don't have time to sort of edit. Right. But, um, at the same time, you know, writing is a little bit more time intensive and laborious and not as fun in my view. Um, and then, yeah, the, the, the HBO podcast, Zach and I, we, we interview some really, you know, interesting folks with uh, different insights on different things. And uh, it's, uh, I think there's been some really good information that's come out and it's, informed me on a lot of things, a lot of topics that I wasn't as uh, you know, well studied on where I've gotten to talk to some of these world leading experts to get their, their thoughts on this. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I was uh, talking to Nevada Gray the other day. She has an actual HBO podcast notebook. So she listens to your podcast. She's actually taking notes on everyone. I thought, wow, that's kind of genius. So. <laughs> Yeah, there is a lot of great information in those. Yeah, no, there is. Yeah, I, 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 most of it I seem to remember, you know, or at least the the points that I, you know, like every guest brings something on that I didn't know. And and, uh, I usually find that, uh, you know, most of that sticks in my head without having to write it down. And and, uh, you could a lot of people, and the nice thing is because people ask me about what about this? What about that? I said, well, we did a podcast on that. Go go listen to the podcast rather than (laughs) having to type out a, you know, a three paragraph answer. I said, you know, so. That's one of the reasons why I started making videos is because I, I was reading all these books and then people are asking about the books and I was like, well, instead of asking me about the books, just read the book, but it's hard to get people to read books, you know, and I use, I use a lot of audio books, which reminds me, I was going to ask you if you had any, if there was any plans to make an audio book out of your, uh, your, uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. We're gonna do an audio book. Uh, it'll probably come out after the, the actual, you know, printed copy comes out. I think that's the way they typically do it with these releases, and they'll probably also be an electronic version as well, a Kindle or whatever your e-book reader is type version. So, yeah, plans for all that. You know, um, I, I'm not sure on the timing on that. How quickly it'll come out after the release? I know they've got to. Uh, you know, because I, I signed a, you know, I, I did a contract for an audio book as well as a written one. So I know that's mm. going to be done. Um, I don't know that I'll be reading it, you mm-hmm. know, maybe someone else. Um, but, but yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll come out as well. Excellent. Yeah, I started making the videos because I was like, well, I'll just do like a book report or a synopsis of the books and then put it on YouTube for people to listen to. I did one on uh, Fat of the Land. And that, that's been one of the most popular things I ever did. I still get people commenting on that and it's been a year. So, and then I started doing the other videos cause it's a great way to communicate. And then the other thing I did is I started a little website called carnivore info and I just take links to videos, articles, studies, whatever. And I file them by category. So when somebody asks me a question, I just, I just send them to that page on the, on the, on the website and then there'll be, you know, a whole variety of different sources, you know, rather than me responding. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's a great thing. That's something that, that you know, we are developing a, a website uh, and a, a number of things that I'll be talking about in more detail, but one of those things is, is something similar, a, re, a, a 
repository of information because we we you know people say well where's your proof where's your study um yeah how do you remember all those studies and you, know? you just gotta you just gotta <laughs> say look here, here's what supports what we're talking about yeah. and you know like i said and I, I know you probably are aware that there there's in the work shortly an actual carnivore study that that is going to be done here with uh um you know a pretty powerful researcher and a big name university uh, coming up in the next few months which is going to be pretty exciting to get that in the literature as well yeah that does sound exciting can't wait all right well i want to thank you for your time you're very generous with your time and your support online i'm sure i'll see you around maybe one of these days we'll do one of those uh, meetups we'll go to a restaurant with some other carnivores and have a yeah, steak I think I think uh, I know. I think there might be one in November in, in the in the Southern California. Area we're, we're thinking right. about doing so. Excellent. So that'll be uh, good. that'll be pretty good. So, Thomas, All I right. appreciate it, and I really appreciate you starting that autistic community because I'm really excited to see what comes out of there, and you know how much. Uh, I mean, what is just to just to ask your perspective? What is your what has been your sort of feedback thus far that you're getting from people that are actually you know, doing the diet that have autism? Well, um, you know, my impression is that, you know, it's clearly, you know, finding a better diet for an individual is always going to be an advantage. I think we all kind of don't, didn't have that mindset that diet was quite as important as we thought it was. You know, when you talk to people, they think they're on a good diet, but everybody's idea of what a good diet is or what a balanced diet is or whatever it just depends on the person and what, whatever influences they've had in the past. But of course, a lot of people on the spectrum, as they say, uh, they have digestive issues. They frequently have seizure issues. They frequently have autoimmune disease. Um, it's kind of hard to find somebody who doesn't have at least a handful of those problems. And when they go on a meat-based diet, they start seeing a lot of those things get better, you know. Depression, and anxiety are very common, especially anxiety. And it seems like it may take a year, it may take two years, it may take three years, but things gradually get better, you know. So um, everything from, you know, I, I think, you know, you've kind of framed this concept of tissue quality. I think people's tissue quality gets better. So they're, they're, uh, they heal faster. They can put on muscle. They, you know, their joints, you know, feel better and they're not nauseated they don't have heartburn they don't have you know digestive issues like they did they start feeling better in in so many different ways it's hard to sort of even imagine it's it sounds too good to be true and i think you know so seeing how people on the spectrum tend to have so many problems moving on to a, a meat-based diet and and uh, sort of eliminating a lot of the the problems that are are making symptoms worse or driving the processes that make these things worse just is a real life-changing experience and it's kind of it sounds too good to be true that's that's probably the hardest thing in delivering the message to people it's like just give it a try you know what could go wrong you know take two ribeyes and call me in the morning you know <laughs> so yeah, good stuff, Thomas. Thank you so much for doing that, by the way. Yeah, well, thank you for uh, for staying in the fight. You do a, you're always present. And I know on social media you got Instagram and Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and everything. And you've uh, kind of hit it with every every resource there is. It seems like so now you got a book coming out. Yeah, there's well, there's a lot. There's more out there that you know potentially. But yeah, like I said, at some point it's it gets to be. Uh, you know, just keeping up with that stuff is is, is almost a full time job. And, you know, trying oh, to do all these other things that, that I'm doing as well. But it's but I enjoy it. It's it's it's, a, it's what my what my sort of purpose is at this point in my life. And uh, uh, you know, like I said, hopefully uh, we'll help. You know, from from the thousands to ten thousand, we'll soon be into the hundreds and millions. You know, hundreds yeah. of thousands and millions uh, in the near future. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tell people all the time how rewarding it is just making a video with somebody, you know, just let them share their story. And then once I get them to do it, they're really happy they did it. So yeah, it's a, when the first person says how much it helped them, you know, it's kind of all worth it right there. 
Yeah, it is. And, and again, a lot of people discount the power of anecdote or story, but I, I don't. I think it is, uh, I think it is uh, extremely motivating, inspiring for people. And at the end of the day, we just want healthy people to, to feel better. And I yeah. think that, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a fun thing. All right. Well, thanks again. And I'm sure I will see you online. Good luck yeah, with the book. Yeah, I'm sure you will, Thomas. And thanks for talking about it. And uh, like I said, hopefully, yeah, like I said, look for maybe a meetup in uh, in November. I think we can I will meet in person again. All right. All right, man. All right. I'll, I'll see you later. Take care. All right. Take care, buddy.